it. Let's go for it. Uh, and the other thing that I'm, I'm completely thankful for is the Supreme Court decision. Man, thank you, Jesus, right? Oh, thank you, God. I, just to be honest, and I think you guys were probably there with me, I never thought I'd ever see that happen. And, and man, by the goodness of God uh, and his sovereignty, this has happened. And, and so, you know, with that said, I mean, I don't know. I don't know where you stand. You might be thinking, you can't talk about polit politics from the pulpit. Well, to me, this isn't politics. It's the truth of God's word. He's the one that's revealed to us our value in the womb, even. And so to stand for life is an awesome thing. Now, before we start, I want to take a moment to pray for, because, of course, with a victory like that, the, the enemy hates it. And we're seeing it pretty, pretty openly, I mean, in, in the social square. Personally, I've been set free from Facebook. I've been off Facebook for like half a year, and I don't plan on going back. So if you get on my account and say, hey, dude, I've done, I'll just go, I don't know. You have to just, maybe my wife might see it. I don't know. But I'm not, I, I'm just, I'm thankful not to be there. But all that to say, there's, there's a lot of kind of threatening stuff coming from those people that are, for lack of a better word, pro-death. So... And, I, and, I, and, and the, the kind of comments that are saying, you know, if we can't do this, then we'll come after you. And so let's just take a moment this morning and really pray for the covering of God over those places that stand for life, Amen. over those facilities that are there uh, for, for young pregnant women to come and get help. We're, we're going to pray protection over them and that God would keep evil from coming. Amen. So Lord, we come before you this morning. You are the one true and living God. And there is power in you, God. And we ask that you'd cover these places. We ask also that you'd, you'd strengthen and fortify, Lord, the words to Joshua, be courageous. Do not be afraid. God, that they would, they would be bold for the truth and they would be bold for life. And God, we pray a hedge of protection. We pray, mighty warrior angels, to surround those places, God, and that the angel armies would encamp and that you'd remind them of those words of Elijah to say, look up to the hills and, and have your eyes open because there are more with us than with them. So we praise you. We cry out to you. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, if you would grab your Bibles and open with me to the book of Galatians, we're picking up in chapter four this morning, right in the place where we left off last week. Makes a little sense. But uh, we're, we're, we're in Galatians. Okay, we're in this section, um, which is a lot of Galatians, where Paul is still continuing to defend the gospel of grace to the churches or before the churches of Galatia, who had been, if you recall, persuaded by something else, a group of zealous Jews who were known as the Judaizers, to turn from trusting in the gospel of grace alone to now keeping Jewish law and tradition in order to have right standing with God. So we're, we're coming right back in. That's kind of our frame of reference. This is what's happening. And Paul's been showing us through the last, or, or, or the last four chapters the seriousness of the error of turning to a religious system or turning to works uh, away from, or, or just, l l let me just say it like this, turning to works in order to have, I don't know, a more qualified or better right standing with God than that is, that is through Christ alone. And so he's been showing us there is, there's only one way that we are to be justified before God, and it's by trusting in Christ, period. That's it. That's the way to be justified before God. He showed us last week that the fullness of time had come in order that the Messiah would come, who was Jesus, and that we could trust in him for our salvation. And we're thankful that that time has come. It came, and we're looking back to that time that was ordained by God for Jesus to come and, and make the payment for our sin so that we could be redeemed. And then Paul reminded them that, that this happened in your midst. You received this. You, you heard this. And that they had trusted in Jesus. So he reminds the church. And last week we saw 
because of that trust in Jesus, one of the main benefits that would come through the Messiah was that he would send us something. He would send us someone that is far superior to the law, namely the Holy Spirit, who confirms that we are sons and heirs by coming into our hearts and, and crying out with our hearts, Abba, Father. So Paul shows us this, and he also reveals to them that going back to the beggarly things, the law, before, uh, those things that you were at before, those places that you were before the Spirit, is just foolishness. And that's the perspective that he puts it into. It's just foolishness to see this grace of Jesus given for us and then to turn to something else is foolishness. And I have to say to that, uh, amen, Paul. <laughs> amen. But also we saw, and this is a great reminder for us in our own lives, mankind is susceptible to this kind of lawful regression. So we need to be aware. And especially in a teaching like this, where Paul is, I mean, he's pouring over this. His heart is so uh, just sound and, and big in reminding us of our own tendency after being saved to begin to start heading back down that road of legalism. To begin to practice certain things which are good and then, and then slowly move into that place of thinking, I'm better than other people because of what I do. That's the wrong answer. And for all those who are in Christ, we are equal in Christ. And our righteousness is complete in Christ. That's pretty full. <laughs> in fact, you can't get much more full than that. Our righteousness is complete in Christ. So I want to start out this morning as we get to verse 12 of chapter 4. That's where we're going to be picking up. I want to start out by asking the same Holy Spirit to come into our midst and to be welcomed into our lives to teach us, to live in us, to convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment in order that we could follow Jesus more closely. Amen? So, Lord, we come before you this morning. Father, we come to you only and always by the precious blood of Jesus. We thank you for the provision that it's made so that we can come to you boldly. And we can ask for the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for your word. It says, if you ask for the Spirit, how much more will the Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit? So Lord, we ask, and Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our hearts and into this place that you would move us. God, that you would bring dry bones alive. God, that you would awaken our hearts and our souls to walk after you, not in the letter of the law, but in the fullness of the life of the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, and by the precious blood of Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So sort of along this same line of thinking, Paul, he gets in, he, he changes his mode just a little bit, and he's, he seems to be going more now, in this little section we're going to look at this morning, into the heart of a shepherd. So this week, we have a heartfelt plea to the church at Galatia, or the churches in the region of Galatia, to follow Jesus. And we're going to start with verse 12, just verse 12 here at the beginning. Verse 12, Paul says, Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. Now, if you just read that, you'd be scratching your head. I'm not exactly sure, Paul, what you're talking about. Seems like a few statements contradict each other there, and then we're talking about injury. I'm a little bit confused. Well, in this verse, Paul makes three different statements interesting, uh, heartfelt statements and this passionate plea. The first thing he says there in verse 12 is, family, I urge you to become like me. It's a pretty interesting and, and powerful statement that he says. And if you're familiar with Paul, you know that he says this in a different place in the scripture, only he words it a little bit differently. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, that Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, which is kind of to say, 
follow me. Come with me as I go follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now, it kind of almost could make you think, is Paul being pride, uh, prideful or proud here to say, you guys just need to be like me? Uh, I don't think that's the heart of Paul. If you think back into the opening of Corinthians, I believe it's Paul that says, guys, there's a problem. You're saying, I'm of Apollo. I'm of Paul. I'm of Cephas. No, we're all of Christ. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about following Jesus. But Paul is giving a sincere and heartfelt call to say, come on, follow. don't follow the Judaizers away from the gospel, away from the new covenant, but follow me into the new covenant, into following Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Which kind of brings a few thoughts into my mind. Follow me in the example that I live or imitate me in the life that I live in order to follow or get close to or imitate Jesus. And the question that I think about this is, is this something I'm comfortable saying to somebody else? I think often in the church, especially the church nowadays, we would shy away from this. We'd actually would say, no, don't look at me. Look at Jesus, right? Don't look at me. Look at Christ. And kind of with the thought that, you know, I have imperfections, which I don't know if you know this or not. I'm going to let you in on this. You do. We all have imperfections, right? And it would be better for someone to look at Christ, but for somebody that doesn't know anything about Jesus, could you say, well, imitate what I'm doing and you'll get closer to the Lord? That, that's kind of an, a, a thought that is, I don't know, it's a heart check thought. I think it's something that's really good for us to think about. So I have to ask the question, would you, able, would you be able to say this to someone in your life at this moment? It's interesting. I, I love the verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, that he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, because it brings my mind into the Jesus dojo, right? Where the whole thought is to practice discipline spiritually in order to learn a technique, in order to be trained in the way of the master, so to speak, right? It, it involves a participating or practicing someone's moves over and over. I did a couple of moves this morning, and I'm definitely not in karate or anything, so I'm sure somebody went, what is he doing up there? Whoo! But anyways... To practice someone's moves or life over and over with discipline in order to master their te technique. And Paul says in this verse, become like me for I became like you. So there's the next little kind of thought provoking, what? For I became like you. What are you talking about? Well, what Paul is saying to the Gentile churches in Galatia is that Paul stepped away from the law. He became like you in this way, that he stopped practicing the law in order to be righteous and trusted in Jesus. What an awesome... Now, that's even more intense when you know who Paul is. And you know his history, right? This man was educated. He was practicing the law. I mean, just about as perfect as a human could. He was educated, he was, went to school under Gamaliel, he was a, a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. This guy left all of those things that identified him previously, left them behind in order to become like Jesus, to trust in the way of Jesus, to trust in the gospel, to come under the fullness of the new covenant, and by faith not by his keeping of the law, to be a child of the promise. Just like Abraham, who he's been continually coming back to as our example. But again, I just think the weight of what Paul had to do to have this right standing in Christ. I think the world will look at it and go, Paul, you're crazy to leave all of the things you've accomplished, everything that identifies you, but he counted it as garbage, rubbish foolishness for the sake of knowing Jesus.
How powerful and awesome an example. So this is the way Paul became like the Gentiles. He left those things and trusted fully in Christ. And lastly, he says something there in verse 12 that I think also kind of is a head scratcher. He says, you have not injured me at all. Now, this is not talking about in the Jesus dojo, sparring with one another or something. Really, what he's talking about here, and I kind of probably need to remind you, but Paul, up to this point in the letter uh, to the Galatians, he's been using very strong words. He's been using very strong analogies. He's called the church that he loves and the churches that he's started and encouraged in growth fools. He, he tells them they've been tricked. He tells them they've been bewitched. In chapter 3, verse 3, Paul said to the Galatians, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Uh, again, some strong words to the church and to these Judaizers that they're beginning to follow. Paul has called them perverters of the gospel, twisting the gospel. He's also called them accursed, which is really to say that he wishes or, or kind of bestows upon them that they'd be damned to hell for the heresy that they're teaching, that strong, powerful words from Paul. So Paul makes the, the points really, really clear, and he's very, very passionate, and he's very, very zealous about it, and he's just to the point. And the reason that he's been saying this stuff isn't to harm them, it's because he's concerned with their salvation. It's because he's sharing the truth. Now, because of this, Paul makes this point in verse 12 to clear up any assumption that anyone might have to think, well, Paul is only saying all this stuff because he's mad. And so he's throwing jabs at us. He's just kind of striking back. Paul says, no, I'm not offended by you. I'm not striking. I'm concerned with your salvation. I'm concerned with your salvation. And yes, what the gospel means is a salvation issue. Because to add to it is to walk away from the, the, the saving grace and blood and provision in Christ alone. So Paul now comes back to uh, really not just their receiving of the gospel. Paul earlier talked about when they first had received the gospel there in chapter 3. He's already mentioned that. Now he's not going to talk so much about the receiving of the gospel, but how they first received him as a messenger of the gospel. So look with me at verse 13, we'll read 13 through 16. Paul says, You know that because of physical infirmity I preached the gospel to you at the first, and my trial which was in my flesh you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. For I have therefore become your, or I'm sorry, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So we get a, a few ideas, a few thoughts in here. But right there at the end, in verse 16, it, it kind of ties in with the thought that we had just looked at previously. It's kind of the other side of the coin. You haven't offended me. I'm not striking at you. And now he says, are you considering me your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? This is my heart. I'm not trying to jab at you. I'm trying to tell you the truth because it matters. I mean, I can look around our world today and say, the truth matters. There's a lot of lies circulating. If the people and the young people in our generations knew the truth, well, Jesus says, if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Amen. Amen. And so when I look at the lies being spread, and the young people heading down those paths to the light, they're going into bondage. And my prayer is that there will be a mighty revival, a great awakening of these young people to say, I've been force-fed lies. This is not giving me satisfaction in life. And who has the answer? You people. It's Jesus. It's the gospel. Amen? Okay. Now that I lost my train of thought, we'll get back to the notes here, see if I can catch up. So Paul seeks only to tell them the truth. 
And of course, in doing so, to keep them walking on that path for their own well-being. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but the whole section here, kind of the overarching theme of these few verses, is the amazing spirit-filled beginning of their relationship with Paul which really is an awesome thing. There's a whole lot in here about Paul and his ministry and the church there. And, and he says when he first came to visit the region of Galatia, he was very well received, open arms. He was loved. And even more importantly, he talks about how well the gospel was received. But Paul starts out by giving us a little insight here into his life that we really don't get a, a whole lot of anywhere else. And that is that as Paul is on his missions trip, his mission journey, he got sick in some way. And according to verse 13, it was because of this infirmity, this sickness in Paul's life, that he ended up going to Galatia. So because he got sick, for some reason, he went towards Galatia instead of where he was going to go. And because of that sickness and because of him going to Galatia, now a whole region has heard the gospel and a fruitful ministry has begun. Now, this kind of leaves us, this question of his illness leaves us with a few questions that when you go through the commentaries, a lot of people guess at what it is. And I'm just going to tell you this morning, I'm going to guess too. We're going to try to do the most educated guess but at the same time, Paul could have, I mean, he's a big boy, he knows how to use words. He could have told us exactly what was happening, and he didn't. You know, he, he, the Galatians knew what it was, and so he was well enough just to say, uh, he was happy enough with just sharing the little that he did. So we got a few questions. I'm going to give some answers that I think line up pretty well, but when we get there, we can ask him, what exactly was going on, Paul? What exactly was your infirmity? But for now, here we go. So what we do know from this text, number one, he was sick. And from verse 15, for some reason, it seems that it had something to do with his eyes because the people there said, hey, we wish we could give you our eyes, which is so funny because I like you guys, but I think I'm keeping my eyeballs. I'm just saying that's a lot of love to say, hey, I wish we could. Now, it, last week, there was a couple of days during VBS that my daughter was sick. And man, her stomach, she had the little flu bug thing going on. And she was wrestling around going, no, I don't want it. I don't want it. And I wish I could have taken it. I'm just saying. I mean, I can understand uh, Paul's sort of pastoral, fatherly heart. Uh, or even the love reciprocated from, to him to say, I wish I could do this. I wish I could take this from you. I'm sure you've been there in life. I wish I could take that sickness from you. But he didn't. He had it. And, and the issue that he had with his eyes, it was because of his sickness that he went to the area of Galatia. Now, it might not have just been his eyes. So probably the, the best, or I would say the most accurate assessment of what's going on here was that Paul probably got infected with a type of malaria in the region of Pisidia, which historians show us during the time of Paul's missionary journeys, this was a place where a lot of malaria was going around right here, like at the same time. So history says there's a lot of this malaria going around. Um, and that it was also pretty bad, and it had a whole lot to do with the, the eyes. And the eyes would, I mean, it was a lot of other things, but one of them, the symptoms, was that the eyes would kind of just run, just kind of goop and be running. You ever had pink eye? Yeah, and you wake up, and your eyes are like goopy but crusted shut. Oh, you just, and you just, ooh. And, and I don't know, man. It sounds like from the text that Paul was looking pretty rough when he showed up. But they still accepted him. They didn't say, ew, Paul, gross, <laughs> go away. They accepted Paul and they accepted his gospel. So, so he gets to this place. Now, why would he have gone to Galatia because of this malaria? Well, I guess the area of uh, Pisidia there was a pretty marshy area, a lot of humidity. And it seems that because Galatia was sort of on a plateau, it was about 3,600 feet higher in elevation, it would sort of be like, hey, you need to get out of this, this weather and this humidity. You need to go up to the area of Galatia. Now, it, it reminds me of something. I don't know if they still do this today. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. 
But back in the day, the doctors, if you had asthma and you lived back east, they'd say, you need to move out west, get into some dry climate. In fact, that's why I'm here, because Mama was having asthma, and the doctor said, go out, get out of this swampy area of Texas and move into Arizona. And so here I am before you today. Again, just like Paul, by the will of God, he had plans that we didn't know about. So thank you, Lord. But it's just one of those things. And I don't know if that's exactly what happened here, but something along those lines. But what we do know from the text is God used Paul's sickness, his difficulty, his trial, to take him to a place that he normally wouldn't have gone so that the gospel would go to a group of people in a region called Galatia. And Paul acknowledges this. Now, there's kind of something that this does. It sort of flies in the face of the doctrine of the word of faith type healing stuff. That poor Paul, if he would have just had enough faith, he wouldn't have been sick. Well, according to Paul, if I wouldn't have been sick, I wouldn't have learned that I can trust God in anything. And also, I wouldn't have learned that I needed to go to Galatia and met these people and this, these churches wouldn't have started. And you think about this, Paul did pray, and I'm not sure if it was this exact same ailment, but Paul did pray three times that his thorn in the flesh would be taken away. But he learned that God's grace is sufficient in his time of need. Amen. I mean, it's just kind of like the word of God is, is true. <laughs> Where it says that if you go through trials that produces character and patience. It's an awesome thing, but Paul was definitely a man of character, and he saw through the cloud to see what God was doing in his life. He had the faith to trust God even when it was hard. God had a plan to work all things together for good in the life of these Galatians and in the life of Paul. So Paul reminds them of how they didn't despise his illness, but they received him, and they showed him a whole bunch of love. It says there in verse 14 that it was as an angel of God and even as Christ. Now, really quickly, I mean, Paul didn't show up. He didn't have wings. He wasn't glowing. He wasn't a small baby on a cloud playing a harp. Paul is saying, and what does an angel of God mean? A messenger of God. He's saying, you, 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 re, you accepted me as a messenger of God, even though my life was a mess. And then in verse 15, Paul calls them to remember all the blessing of it, of them receiving him, and like them receiving Jesus, how how amazing and accepting they were of him and of the gospel. And so Paul shows them all of this stuff, reminds them of what awesome people they are and how they accepted him. And now, They're looking at Paul, and they're upset with Paul. So Paul's kind of bringing them to this question. So what changed? I didn't change. What happened in your life? Or I would say, namely this, it seems like you've been persuaded by someone in a different way. Because now it seems like I'm your enemy. But I tell you the truth. Paul tells them the truth in regards to the gospel and in, the, in regards to the working of the law. And so now Pastor Paul moves on to tell them to bring to their attention, here's what changed. And it was these Judaizers. They've gotten in with you. They've put in additions to the gospel, which, by the way, he already said, is not another gospel. In fact, it takes the gospel of grace and puts works into it that you got to keep in order to have right standing with God. I don't know about you, but that's not good news. To have to work and earn some sort of perfection before a God who is actually perfect takes me back to the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not lie. I'm busted. Right off the top. You shall not steal. Oh, man, I don't, I remember the first time I stole. It was a really interesting thing. I was in the store, and there was this candy everywhere in this one certain place. And I I thought to myself, man, that looks really good. And so I grabbed a piece and put it in my pocket and walked out the door. And 
I, 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 I we were, was with my mom. We were getting into the car. Of course, she checked out her stuff, but my candy was in my pocket. And I walked out to the car, and I sat down in there. I don't remember exactly how old I was, but I started opening my candy. And my mom goes, wait a second, where'd you get that? I said, in the store. They got all kinds of it. <laughs> She's like, you have to pay for that. And so she took me back into the store. We actually, I believe we went to the manager, and I said, I took that. And, it, and the whole thing, it was, it, was a, it was a testament to the consciousness that God puts in us because I felt bad. I mean, you don't have to teach people to break the law. It just, it happens naturally. I'm gifted, what can I say? I have the gift. <laughs> So the, the addition of, and I'm sorry I got on a rabbit trail, but the addition of any kind of keeping of the law to the grace of Jesus and the gospel of the cross, it's not good news. It's bad news because we cannot keep it. So Paul says, here's what changed in you, Galatians, verse 17. It's these Judaizers. They zealously court you, but for no good. yes. They want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. So Paul, he just, he calls it what it is. He identifies it. He says, he, they're zealously courting you. They're trying to woo you, but it's for no good. They're trying to woo you. And here's how you can tell. And this is, I'd have to say, this is a word for us too. If somebody shows up at your door with an addition to a gospel or another gospel uh, here's some signs for us to be aware of. And I mean, sometimes you might, they might be a little cunning and you might not have exactly the tools to say, oh no, this is wrong. So here's something for us to be aware of. Number one, they want to exclude you. They want you to come with them. So they want to exclude you to who? To themselves. They want you to believe what they believe from the solid Word of God. So they want you to, se they want to separate. In fact, sometimes they'll say, oh, no, no, your Bible is not quite right. You need to come this way. You need to go with us. You need to be, and, and so they're exclusive. <clears throat> so they exclude us to themselves and not the gospel, not your own relationship with Jesus. They're not their concern that you would have a real relationship with Jesus. They're concerned that you would go and be excluded to them, that you would be zealous for something that's not Jesus or the gospel but for them and the things that they are zealous for. Now, a while back, it's got to have been five, maybe seven years ago, we had some Jehovah's Witnesses show up on the door at our house. And I mean, I'll talk to you. I'm mean, okay, let's talk. And so they started, they kept kind of talking about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. And I, and I finally, I, I, I stopped them for a second. And I said, I'm a part of the kingdom right now. I'm a child of God. Like I'm in his kingdom. And they were like, oh. <laughs> they started trying to change the topic. And, and, and one thing when I stepped back from that whole situation I looked at was they weren't concerned with me believing in Jesus. They were concerned with me believing and coming and excluding myself to them. So beware of those. And I'm so thankful for our little witnessing team. We got a witnessing team that goes out two times a month. I think it's two times a month. It might be more than that. But maybe it's four times a month. They go out four times a month, and they've been going into this neighborhood. And there's been just some awesome fruit. I got a picture of me and, and a couple of the witnessing guys and one of the guys that had just given his life to Jesus said, yeah, I want that. I want Jesus. I'm like, yes! But that's the difference. That's the difference. I mean, we recommend, we ask them to go to a church, but you don't have to go to this church to believe in Jesus. You need to have a relationship with him. So here we go. This is the difference. They're pulling them to have zeal for themselves. Now, Paul, after making this statement, he basically says, but I'm not against you being zealous. I wish. I, it's almost like Paul saying, I wish we were more zealous. Verse 18, it is good to be zealous in a good thing sometimes. No, that's not the right translation. What does it say? Always. It is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I'm here with you. Basically, Paul's saying, man, you guys, don't lose your fervor when I'm gone. In other words, don't lose your fervor when you leave church. I want you to know something. When you leave this building, you're taking Jesus with you. You have the Spirit of God in your life. 
So when you leave this building, continue on in the fervor. Continue on in the zeal for the Lord. So the, the idea of zeal is to desire something eagerly, to have a passion, to have a fervency, which is the idea of a fervency of heat. Like you're, you're catching on fire, so to speak. You're, you're warming up. You're fervent towards the Lord. And, and Paul says, always be fervent toward God. So, let me ask you this morning, if I was to have a thermometer up here with, a, with a, a gauge from 1 to 10, how would you rate yourself in the level of zeal that you have for the Lord? It's a good question to ask. Man, would I be like a, a warm 3, 3 plus, 4? I know I couldn't say I'm a 9. I'm just not there. But where am I at? Seriously, before the Lord, God, where am I at in my zeal? Do I have enough? Lord, I want more. And if you don't have enough, I want to call you this morning, not just to become aware of it, but to come back to your first love, to come back to that place. And when I think about a first love, I think about I think about a, a, an engagement. I think about a honeymoon. I think about a, a, a passion that is there, a zeal that is there, a love that is there. And the Lord wants to be in love with us and wants our fervor and our zeal for him. So like Paul this morning, I challenge you to think back in your relationship, just like he just did. Think back in your relationship to when you first came to Jesus and say, God, I want this passion again. I want this zeal for you again. And go back to that place to fall in love with him again through the gospel, through what he's done. So Paul moves forward here. And we really see some more in this last uh, verse, a couple of verses here that I'm going to go over. Paul moves forward. He, he changes gears a little bit. It's like he gets this sort of fatherly sort of love. And if you'll excuse me one second, I am making sure that our air conditionings are turned up because it's warm in here. Sorry. I know I, I can do that up here. It's distracting. Hopefully it will cool. <clears throat> So he, he kind of has this fatherly heart. Look with me at verse 19. He says, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Now, this is, a, <laughs> this is an interesting scripture. Verse 19, Paul, again, his parental kind of thing, almost like motherly-like in this thing. He, he, he says, My little children... My kids, which really quickly, this is an awesome statement from Paul because they are getting into a mess here spiritually. And he doesn't go, oh, forget you guys. You know, I don't know if you, if you, if you have kids and you have a spouse and you come home and they're in a mess. Usually one of the spouses is going, go talk to your kids. There's no claiming those kids. They're going, oh, and Paul walks in. They're in a mess, but he still claims them. And what a picture of God's heart towards us. You might be here this morning and go, I'm in a mess. God's heart towards you is, my kid, I got better for you. I'm here for you. I want to walk with you through this in your life. But Paul says, my kids. And then he says, for whom I labor again until Christ is formed in you. For whom I labor again. Now, let me just say this. There is, I think, a word here that no mother would, would ever want to hear. You know, go to the doctor. You got your teenage kid with you. Doctor says, you know what you need to do is you're going to have to labor this kid again. <laughs> He's going to have to come out <laughs> one more time. Pretty sure my wife would look at my son and probably say, oh, no, you ain't. Mm -mm. <laughs> Not going to happen. But this is what Paul is saying. He's claiming them as kids and then he's saying, currently, I am back to laboring for you again because you've taken that seed of the gospel 
and you've began to forsake it to walk after something else. But the difference is, Paul's not laboring here that they might be born. It's interesting in the text, he's kind of, he's laboring that Christ would be born in them. That Christ would be born in them. That he would be formed in them. Which kind of carries the idea that these churches in Galatia, when they were turned to from Jesus and the gospel to the keeping of the law with their own righteousness, it sort of carries the idea that they left that, they kind of miscarried the gospel, so to speak. And now Jesus needs to be born in them again in order to bring them up into the maturity in Christ. So then in verse 20, we see here Paul's heart to be there. And he knows, he understands, letters are, are good and they're needed and they're, they're helpful, but they're, they're not as good as the presence of somebody being there. He wishes he could be there, and one of the reasons is because he can't hear, they can't hear the tone of his voice in a letter. And, and, and this is one of those things that I think you might be a little bit familiar with. Have you ever been guilty of receiving a text and interpreting the tone of the text wrong? Usually it's one of those things where you sort of guess a tone and then you assume a tone and then you're going, I can't believe that person would say that to me and how they said it. I could just imagine what they're saying. And then you go talk to the person and they're like, that's not what I meant at all. I was saying it like this. And then you go, oh, now I got to go talk to the three people that I told that you're a jerk, you know? <laughs> Because it can, get it, it can get us into trouble when we assume a tone on a text. So often I'm like, oh, I'd rather just call. This is, in fact, when that happens, a lot of times I'll go in, okay, enough. What's going on? How's it going? You know, instead of trying to figure out and assuming, oh, these evil people are texting me. <clears throat> so Paul just, he says, this is something that happens, and I know you guys hearing this, I wish you could just hear my tone. Because I want to change tones. Now, really, I look at this and I think, honestly, I'm not sure which way he wants to go with his tone. It sounds like he's coming from fatherly to saying, I want to change my tone because I have doubts about you people. But Paul wraps up here. He wraps up with another example to them in verses 21 through 31 of what their sin looks like on them. It's a great analogy. We're not going to get to it this morning. We're, we're going to wrap up this morning right now. So I want to ask Beth to come up uh, and lead us uh, in, a, in a song this morning. But as I think about the text that we're looking at, as I think about the heart of Paul, and as I think about his challenges to us, the challenges to imitate Christ, the challenges to follow Challenges even to make disciples, to be willing to ask someone to imitate us as we imitate Christ. That's a, that's a hearty challenge this morning. I, I challenge us to bring our hearts before the Lord. Let's all stand this morning. And as, as we get into this song, there's, there's one more thing that I wanted to mention from the text. And that is back to that place of the zeal that we should have as believers for our great Savior. And I just want to challenge us to come to a freshness in that zeal, to come back to the first love. And I think about that first love, and I think about the analogy of, of Christ being the groom and, and the church being the bride. And I think so often I think of the church and I think of my own life and I think, man, what a sad marriage it would be if the groom is excited for the bride and the bride came in and everyone's like, oh, is this the best day ever? And she's like, eh. <laughs> Groom's cool. It's all right. And man, I look at the world and the church in America and I think, that's kind of what the church, the greater church in America is like. Oh, yeah, it's cool. God, would you light our hearts on fire? God, I pray this morning you forgive us of our complacency of looking around this world to things and thinking they would satisfy us. 
and forsaking our first love, our true love. God, that we would come back to you, that we would have a real passion. And on that day that you come for your bride, that we would be passionate, that we would have a longing, we would be excited. And not only on that day, but as we live this life, that we would have that zeal, that salt, that light, that attractiveness to the world around us that so needs your love and your truth. God, light us on fire. We pray, we, we thank you, we praise you this morning. Father, I pray this morning that you would forgive us, Lord, those times that we lose our fervor, God, and those times that we lose that passion and desire, and I pray by the Holy Spirit you would fill us, that you'd baptize us afresh in your spirit, God, that we would walk this life pleasing to you, Lord. And not by our own strength and not by keeping of the law, but by a relationship with you, but by abiding in you. For apart from you, we can do nothing, but with you, we can do all things. And we thank you for that truth. Lord, we, we just ask that you would fill us now, be with us in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. Amen. God bless you.